Welcome to the Medical Muse podcast. Discover the humanistic aspects of physicians and scientists as they describe their career paths and any advice they have for current medical students. Each episode, we interview a new guest and discuss the future of the field. This is the Medical Muse. Hey everyone, uh, we have Dr. Badia here with us today. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Badia is an internationally renowned orthopedic surgeon who completed his undergraduate degree at Cornell University and received his Doctor of Medicine from New York University. Dr. Badia went on to complete his general surgery internship as well as his orthopedic residency at Bellevue Hospital and NYU. Dr. Badia then went on to complete a fellowship for hand and upper extremity surgery at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh. Since then, Dr. Badia has been tremendously successful not only as a surgeon, but also as an entrepreneur and author. He has just come out with a new book called Healthcare from the Trenches. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Badia. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. So Dr. Badia, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you originally from? Well, I've been a quarter century in Miami, which I feel like it's like uh, Mecca, in the, you know, maybe in the Arab world for, for Cubans. So I was born in Cuba but grew up in Northern New Jersey, which was another kind of hotbed of Cuban Americans and uh, went to public school there, uh, but always kind of knew I'd, I'd head South. And when I was in medical school, then residency and living in Manhattan, I, I, uh, I started making inroads, uh, even doing a, a couple summers here, including one summer of research. So I always had an inkling to come down here, but um, I'm definitely a, a New Yorker at heart, and I, and well, now half of New York wants to come down here, so I think I had some good foresight. <laughs> That's right. Did you see a, a big culture difference as you shifted from growing up in or being in um, Cuba and around that kind of culture, and then moving up to to New York? Well, I, I no, I came as a child. My 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 dad is from my entire family still lives in Valencia, Spain. My dad, after the Spanish Civil War. Uh, uh, emigrated with his parents. He's an only child to Havana. I was born there, but I left as a baby. So the, the only culture change really is northern New Jersey to Miami, which frankly is not that different. A lot of similar ethnic groups. Um, obviously, the weather is a big difference. And I'm, uh, I'm I, well, I just told you guys about boating. I, I'm really a water person. I was a swimmer in high school. And I always wanted to be kind of a uh, in the water and kind of set my sights on that even even applying during um, looking for jobs later on in, in, in kind of those environments so I, I knew I wouldn't stay in the northeast but definitely my my character is is, is a New Yorker That's so, fantastic. Um, so uh, what when did you become interested in medicine and um, I think we read that your grandmother had something to do with that decision so if you could also elaborate on that yeah, so you know, I was I was very inspired uh, by a book, The Making of a Surgeon, but certainly it was before that. And uh, I think the first third of my book is a lot about my my path, which is similar to many others. So I think people will will be able to relate to that, or, or hopefully some of the younger people may be inspired, uh, as I was, by William Nolan's book, which I read when I was eleven, The Making of a Surgeon, and again at um, sixteen when I was starting to apply colleges but the crystallizing moment I think was when I was eight years old I went with my uh, paternal grandmother who had very debilitated rheumatoid arthritis the total hand deformities and very very classic deformity for that disease and we went to see a hand surgeon a Columbia Presbyterian who at the time I, I didn't know who he was um, somebody at the door sorry <laughs> And it, it turned out to be Bob Carroll, who was one of only two hand surgeons uh, at that time in, uh, in New York City. And later on, I would find out that, that my mentor, Joe Imbriglia, was trained by Bob Carroll. So that Joe Imbriglia was in, in Pittsburgh, and he was a Carroll fellow. Um, that, so that was, that was pretty incredible coincidence. But I also had a lot of family in Cuba who were physicians. So there was definitely some um, heritage there on, on the maternal side. My dad's an engineer, electrical engineer. I, you know, me and calculus, I, I got through, but that was definitely not my thing. Uh, I, I always liked the natural sciences. 
Wonderful. Um, so do you mind telling us a little bit about your medical school experience? Yeah. Um, it, you know, it was a great, a great place. I will tell you, um, each, each step along the way, I feel very fortunate because they were, they were really ideal places for me. In, in terms of medical school, it's very opposite, right, from the experience in Ithaca, New York, idyllic Finger Lakes region, beautiful campus. I was a frat boy, uh, played intramural sports, uh, studied a lot. I mean, Cornell is not a, uh, you know, it's not a cushy school by any means. So it was, it was rigorous school. So I was well prepared for medical school. Uh, what, was, what was great about it, though, was it's in an urban environment. And the teaching hospital is Bellevue. And so that's the, the other irony, and I talk about in the book, is that the making of a surgeon, uh, the setting was Bellevue Hospital and, and the Cornell division. And, and uh, Will, you know, William Nolan says that he, at that time it was NYU, Columbia, and Cornell, and he picked Cornell randomly because he thought it was a, the, ritz, the ritziest sounding <laughs> of, the, of the divisions. So he trained at Bellevue and I would later train at Bellevue and I was already getting that exposure during, during medical school where you know, if you're interested in, in surgery, even as a third year medical student, the second year resident might take you through a hernia. And if you, you, know, you practice your suturing and you, you tie knots on the post of your, uh, uh, of your, uh, you, you know, your bed and you're practicing your one-handed knots and they see that, they'll give you a chance. And that, that is a, a great um, uh, you know, experience for somebody who knows that they're, they're heading a certain way. Uh, that might not happen, uh, I'd say Cornell, uh, Cornell Medical School, where some of my friends, but I mean, at, at the private hospital, you're not able to do as much of that. So in Bellevue, it's kind of like Jackson Memorial down here, right? Or maybe even Broward General. Uh, there was the, the, really the, the opportunity to really get your hands wet. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have had it any other way. That was really worked out great for me. It makes a lot of sense. Do you remember the first time you either saw some sort of trauma or like a bloody situation? And did how yeah. that feel? Yeah, you know, I, I want to comment on that. Um, I um, have always been very open about students giving the opportunity to observe, uh, probably because I wasn't. I, I tried as a high school student to observe. I, uh, and, and I remember one night I spent in an ER in um, Elizabeth, New Jersey, where I grew up. And uh, I remember thinking how arduous it was to even get that experience. I mean, I'm, I was happy to stand in a corner and just, just watch. So I didn't witness any surgery at all until I was a first year medical student. And that was because at NYU, they had a, a program you could sign up. And the first surgery I ever saw uh, Daniel was actually very bloody. <laughs> it was a prisoner who had jumped uh, uh, off the second or third floor in the prison to, I don't know if it, to escape or, uh, but he shattered his tibia. So he had a tibial plateau fracture. So the first surgery I ever saw was orthopedic. And I remember they, they made incision in the knee and it's bunch of his dark blood just poured out because he had just shattered his knee. Uh, but that, that was, that was pretty cool. The other student, it was a, uh, uh, a gal was, a gal was actually dating who is now the chief of pulmonary. She, uh, uh, at the time, I remember she felt queasy, but, uh, but I loved it. And, and I, I, but it always stuck to me that you give people the opportunity to uh, observe, uh, shadow, ask questions, you know, get, get inspired. Have you witnessed any students get queasy, like when they're working with yeah. you? Uh, yes, it's happened a, a couple of times, yeah. It's happened a couple of times, and yeah, usually just have them sit down. Or and I, I remember one, uh, one actually left. I, I had to had to leave. <laughs> so it does happen. Yep, it does happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that experience with us. Um, so, where did you go to residency, and can you elaborate on your experience during residency? Sure. Well, I, I ended up staying at the same place. Uh, you know, orthopedics is pretty difficult to match in. The, the irony is, I ranked. Uh, uh, University of Miami, Jackson Memorial, very high because I knew I wanted to come down here. In, in retrospect, I'm very glad I did it. Uh, in fact, when I told them uh, where I was, or what, you know, they, I could feel like they sort of dissuaded me. Um, but I ended up matching at NYU and 
Um, I guess it's a good thing that they must have liked me if they put me up high because they knew me already as a medical student. Uh, but I, I, I did want a change of environment. Uh, but but in, in retrospect, I'm actually glad I stayed there because uh, Manhattan's a dynamic place. Uh, I bought it, uh, my dad helped me buy a little one bedroom apartment that we got for next to nothing at that time. And I, I spent five years there. And again, Bellevue was a place where you really learn to operate. You, you, you know, there's certainly there's some supervision, but you know, help, not a lot. I mean, most of the, the fourth year resident takes the second year resident through smaller cases. The chief uh, resident operates on the, the what, they, what they like to do, the joint replacements or this and that. Uh, and, uh, and you're in the middle of the night when you get these major traumas. Um, you know, the, the attending staff is usually not there. Uh, now it's changed. And I, I comment a lot on that in my book. So I think that's an interesting chapter. I think it's chapter uh, three, where I talk about the formation of the Bell Commission, where the uh, hours of residence were curtailed. And, and uh, I, I, I comment on that, not, not very kindly, because I think that should be us physicians who determine what the, the, the training schedule should be like. And there are certainly pros and cons about limiting the hours. So I, I lived through that because one of the gals um, in my year, who I don't remember, I never met her, she, um, she blew the whistle. So, you know, you talk about these whistleblower. I mean, at that time, you know, now whistleblowers are ubiquitous, unfortunately, in our culture. But uh, at that time, it was unusual and it made the front page of the paper. So I, I, I won't delve into that anymore, but I think people should read it. I think it's a great story. And it really, I mean, I, I literally was at the epicenter of that whole change of curtailing resident uh, hours. Uh, but, it, you know, if, if I had to do it all over again, I, I, I think I would do the same. Mm -hmm. What were some of the biggest challenges uh, to becoming a surgeon that you experienced? Ooh. You know, it's like many things. If you're very focused and motivated on something, I mean, you know, you, you'll get there, right? I mean, if, I mean, if you're very hyper motivated, um, if you aren't, I mean, uh, example, my intern year, the guy who was on the actually Coincidentally, the orthopedic service, I was doing general surgery, but they have us as the interns basically doing all the scut work, doing all the, you know, at that time we would draw our own bloods. So we had to go around at 5.30 in the morning, draw people's bloods. And, and this guy had, um, uh, he matched in ortho. And I, if I recall, he had done a year of internal medicine or all, all I know is he, after two weeks, he was out and he went and became an internist. So, you, you know, everybody has their niche, uh, but you'll know early on, I think in residency and, you know, people don't know this, but the, the, the most common switch from one field to another, you guys have an idea of what, what from one specialty, you know, what is the most common trend change that a first year an intern will make? You ever heard about this? I would get out of surgery to maybe like family or something. Uh, that's a good guess from, from, from general surgery to psychiatry. I can see that. Really? I, uh, yeah, that, that was baffling to me. I mean, they're completely different. So, uh, but, but you do, you do get people and, and that opens up spots. So the, um, the guy who filled that spot was the son of a very well-known Haitian, uh, Haitian American uh, surgeon at a hospital for joint disease. And in fact, he practices in plantation. Uh, he does general orthopedics. He didn't do a fellowship. Uh, a great guy. So, you know, he ended up getting a spot. He was a, he was actually a foreign grad. So he really lucked out to get an orthopedic spot. Interesting. So uh, we also read that you were practicing in Germany for a bit. Do you mind uh, elaborating on that experience? Um, yeah, that was, yeah, a little bit of foreshadowing because I talk about Germany in the last chapter of the book. Okay. Uh, but, but no, in, in the... I guess it was the uh, also towards the end of the third chapter, which is mostly about my my residency and fellowship. I did a uh, it was an awarded fellowship. You had to apply for it. It was only two months, but it gave me exposure to a whole nother healthcare system. And the the irony about it is the, the guy I worked with, my mentor, was really way ahead of his time. He he was a hand surgeon who, with a couple other doctors, had started in a, an ASC, an ambulatory surgery center. And this was 25 years ago uh, in Germany. And, and 
fact, I don't think we ever went to the hospital, uh, maybe once in that, ro in that rotation with him. So he had his office upstairs, the surgery center, you go down these steps, and right there, there were three operating rooms. And they would do a variety of things. They did some uh, pediatric surgery even, which was unusual. Uh, so so I, I learned a lot about the, the dynamics of private practice in, in a whole nother, in a European system. So that, that, that was a great experience. So I, I, I definitely would urge people to be exposed to other systems, whether they're doing a medical mission, which, which I've done, uh, or, or just immersing yourself in another healthcare system. That's amazing. Um, so why uh, did you choose to do your fellowship in uh, the upper extremity? And um, how should people think about approaching uh, subspecializing? Well, the answer is pretty easy. You, you find out what is the common, uh, what is the most common bread and butter thing you do in that field? And if that's interesting to you, then great. You, it's not like, you know, when you're in medical school and you see all these zebras, you know, you're not, you know, if you're an internist, you're not going to see theochromocytomas every day, right? You're managing hypertension and, and, and diabetes and, um, and, 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 you know, taking care of somebody's overall health. If you like that, and there's a lot of reasons to like that, right? Uh, great. Um, me, like I did a uh, rotation, you know, in, 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 um, during, during my internship in cardiothoracic surgery, really exciting surgery. Loved it, but I thought, you know what? They, they, do, they do valve replacements, they do bypasses, they do maybe some aortic work. I mean, there's three or four major operations they do day in and day out. And that's fine if you, you know, if you're like my dad, my dad loves a restaurant and goes, and, and goes to that same restaurant, he gets to know everybody. I mean, it's me, I, I'm, when I have a free night, I go, okay, what haven't I tried? And hand surgery is perfect for that. People don't know because people aren't even aware it's a specialty, right? So at least in, when you're in, in South Beach, people go, oh, hand surgery. What, what do you do to make the hand look better? <laughs> what do you, like, they think it's a cosmetic thing. <laughs> but no, I, uh, I'm the guy you go to when you, you put your hand in a circular saw or working at a you know, wood shop or something. Uh, so it's, it's trauma, it's, it's arthritis, it's congenital, it's um, inflammatory problems, it's nerves, it's vascular surgery, it's all these different specialties but from the here down, right? Uh, so I found it to be incredibly diverse. I mean, in a, in a typical day, I do a lot of different type of surgeries. Now, some people may not like that, but that appeals to my personality. So I think it's important for that, for, for students to, to do those rotations, particularly during your fourth year of medical school. And that's what people will do, you know, a month of derm or a month of neurosurgery or what have you. and and decide because it's a tough decision to make right your whole life you know I'm, i was lucky is that i realized early on um i did a summer of some research in cardiology but you know that that wasn't for me do you know if you want to become a hand surgeon specifically is is there only one route or are there a couple of different ways you can do it for instance general surgery to hand or do you have to do an orthopedic fellowship first um yeah very good question it actually uh, um, Hand surgery, kind of like neurosurgery has, um, not neurosurgery, spine surgery. Spine surgery can be neuro or, or ortho. Um, uh, I'm a little biased, uh, but the majority of the members of the American Society for Surgery to Hand are orthopedic trained. There's, there's quite a few plastic surgery. And then you mentioned general surgery. And in fact, in Miami, there's two. There's one who works um, in our center. But the problem with general surgery is you get all this training in abdominal and you, you treat sick patients. You don't really do that in hand surgery. And uh, hand surgery requires a lot of different disciplines. So you do microsurgery, you do trauma work, you do soft tissue coverage. But the other thing you do is arthroscopy. And if you've never scoped a knee, scoped a shoulder, how are you gonna scope the wrist? Which I did three of them the other day. And you know the guy was, that student was like you know, gaga because he had never seen his diverse anatomy in the wrist. And orthopedics gives you a great background. For, for all of that. So there are, there are three different tracks, but the, the majority of people do orthopedics and then hand. Okay. When you do a surgery on the hand, what, like with all the different surgeries that you can do, um, what are the different time ranges? For instance, there might be one procedure that takes you an hour and then are there some that might take you six hours or what's your day look like? 
Uh, I'm going to tell you can go anywhere from a minute to um, this was a case my 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 old partner did at, at Baptist that took 36 hours. So what I, see what I talk about variety now in typical private practice nowadays that's not my range is typically a few minutes for say a pin removal or a, the other day I did a, a boxer's fracture actually faculty at one of the, the medical schools and. I, I, I nailed the, just in the right trajectory, the first shot. I mean, it took about six minutes uh, to do it and I fixed her uh, and then I put the splint on uh, in total. So that's six minutes, uh, but it's, it's unusual. I do anything nowadays that takes more than two hours. So my, my typical day, not now, you know, pre COVID when my ramped up, my, my typical day was 12 to 12 to 15 surgeries in a day, but I run three rooms. So uh, I talk about that in the book as well as efficiency. It, it's impossible to do that in a hospital. Like it, it's just impossible. For one, most places won't give you two rooms. So you have to, because if you're doing one case after another in the same room, you have to wait for them to take the patient out, wake them up, clean the room. Especially now, cleaning the room takes more time now, right? Mm -hmm. Then bring them in, sedate them, position them, prep and drape. In, a, in, a, in an ASC, I do that in two rooms, but usually three. So I run, I run three rooms sequentially. So it's not unusual that by nine o'clock, nine fifteen, I have four or five surgeries done. Wow! Starting at seven thirty. Um, so it, it's extremely efficient, and I, I think that you always have to keep that in mind to be efficient because you know we work hard as doctors, and if you're not efficient, you're not going to have much time, you know, to take the boat out or 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 you know do your Pilates or or you know whatever hobbies you might have, um, you, you have to you have to really manage your time well. And that's yeah. something I'm, I'm teaching my young children now. One's twelve, the other's fourteen, and you know they're a mess with that. So I'm trying to instill those habits now. That actually perfectly leads right into our next question. Um, <laughs> some of our friends have had the opportunity to observe surgeries with you at your surgical center, and uh, they were very impressed with the efficiency of your process. Um, yeah. Can you explain to us what else distinguishes your surgical center from other surgical centers and how important it is to have the right team? Well, my, my, my surgical center was something that I, I, I really built almost single-handedly. Um, so I, I, I had a very good model in mind. When I came to Miami in, in, in 95, I co-founded a place called the Miami Hand Center, which, which still really exists in name. Um, the group disbanded in 2008 or so, but, but during not the first two years, but once we built our own two room, tiny room surgery center, it was incredibly efficient. Um, and we would sometimes go all night. I'd come in in the morning for my elective cases. I'd see my anesthesiologist had like a, you know, a five o'clock shadow <laughs> and that's because they'd been up all night. So we, 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 we realized that we could be so much more efficient than the hospitals. So I was already kind of spoiled with that. So when I, I left the group, the group then ended up disbanding, but uh, all of us are separate and, and doing very well. I didn't want to go backwards. So I built my surgery center and I built it uh, with a couple of things in mind. One is initially the architect said I could only have two rooms. So I, I, we, I, I changed the plans around the way so I could have three. And, and now I'm totally <laughs> happy to have three because that's where that efficiency comes in, right? So, uh, our, our, our center was different in that uh, I was doing joint replacements early on, well before it was a rage. Now I don't do knees, but I've been doing shoulder and, and elbow and it, all those replacements well before most people did them. And, and that was because we had good anesthesia, good nursing. Um, I was efficient. You can't be taking hours and hours because then there's more blood loss, more complication, more anesthesia issues. So if you're efficient, then you can do that. And the other thing is that I, I saw an opportunity in Miami that we are kind of the capital of Latin America and the Caribbean. So I, I quickly started to focus on those patients because I saw that the healthcare system, the US system was really, you know, for us doctors was just um, on the skids. And I realized that, I, uh, that, that those patients, it, it was a, a, different, it's a different medicine. They come here, not because they found me in their blue cross book and they, and they just, you know, am I in network? They found me because, you know, they, they looked up my credentials. They, 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 they cared about where I trained. They, 
they, they talk to other patients say, and like today I saw, you know, somebody from Mexico City and Peru and, um, and, and those patients come. So our surgery center is very known for, for uh, not only international patients, but people who come from other cities because they've had maybe a local opinion. Um, and it's not just me. I mean, I think I'm, I'm the main driver of that, but we're doing spine surgery now. We're the first center to do an anterior fusion, it means that the general surgeon, you know, laparotomy opens the abdomen, retracts the bowels, and we instrument the spine from the front. We're the only ones who've done that in the state of Florida, to my knowledge. Wow. Um, we're doing, um, we, we have our first hip replacement uh, coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. I know that there's other places in the state that have done them, but, but they're not commonplace. So we've really been on, on, the, on the, the cutting edge. Uh, perhaps I, I, I had a little bit of a vision about what would be happening with the hospital systems. And certainly this little pesky virus has made people wary of the hospital because there's other bad bugs there. I mean, not, you obviously need the hospital, but for the type of stuff I do, a lot of what my colleagues do, you, you, don't, need, you don't need beds upstairs. The patient can go home. And if the patient goes home, that means there isn't the sicker patients where you have your, your MRSA, your, uh, your, your, your other types of, you know, your, your gram-negative uh, bacteria that are, you know, infiltrated in a hospital. Um, and it's expensive and it's, in, and it's inefficient, right? Because it's a big place. Now, some some are, are fairly efficient, but for the most part, when you're in a, in a small center, again, efficiency to me is the name of the game. And it ends up sa saving money and it helps for customer service. People don't like to wait around. That's interesting. So not only are you able to save the system a little bit of money, you can potentially um, have a lot less bad outcomes because of the infections and other things like that that you were just Absolutely. talking about. Absolutely. In fact, in our, another article just came out about the, the outcomes are actually better in an ASC for a select number of surgeries they, they looked at prospectively. They found the, the outcomes were actually uh, better. Why? It's the same team doing the same thing. You know, when I, when I was chief of hand surgery at Baptist, I mean, it's not their fault, but if you come in at night, do a case, I've had, you know, surgical techs have said, you know, doc, I've never seen this. Can you help me? You know, I usually do, during the day, I do vascular surgery, you know, but I'm, I'm on, you know, call tonight. And so they come in and are setting up your table and they've never done that case with you. At, at our ASC, it's like, it's like a symphony, you know, and I'm, I'm sure the med, your, your colleagues told you. Um, and that's because we do it day in and day out. And, and that's really the, the best way to do things. I, I tell patients, look, sometimes you might wait in a doctor's office, but if you're going to a surgeon and that, that waiting room is empty, I suggest you run. <laughs> you, know, you, you want somebody who, who, who has repetition, who has experience, who has practice. Now, I've heard this and I would imagine it's false because I can't even tell you where I heard it, but I heard if you're gonna get a major surgery or just a surgery, and let's say there's some sort of complication and it's gonna require you to be hospitalized, um, that outpatient surgery centers can sometimes have a hard, you have a hard time getting them to pay for those medical expenses. Is that something that you hear or is that false or? Oh, um, so you're saying that if you have a, if there's a surgical complication, which happens, right? A, a complication, you're saying that insurance carriers are, are negating paying now Whereas if you were to get it in the hospital, the hospital would, would go ahead and pay for it a little easier. I don't know if that's accurate, but I've heard that. Well, well here's one thing that's clear, okay? The hospital lobby, the uh, American Hospital Association is a, you know, it's the billion dollar. Multi so, so the hospital lobby is very powerful, okay? And, you know, unfortunately, and I, I've learned this the hard way during the past you know, decade or so is that really whoever has the political and, and cloud and usually which takes money um, often has advantages. And um, frankly, I, I, don't, I don't think that's fair. I think what we need to look at is what the outcomes are. The, the reality is the hospitals are, are much better at getting paid uh, by, by the insurance companies. Uh, for one, they have relationships. So you take a big healthcare system, they have relationships with the big player, players. You know, I mean, they, there's no doubt in my mind. I know for a fact that they meet up somewhere and they drink scotch and they and they, they yeah. hammer this stuff out. Whereas, you know, we're in the trenches, right? We're, we, we don't, you know, I don't have those relationships. And even our surgery center, which is smaller now, if you, there are big companies now and, and 
we are now with, uh, we, we now are partnered basically with a big company that's based in the Midwest and they have, you know, well over 200 ASC. So we've, we've got some clout uh, politically, but it's very hard to compete with the hospitals. And I think that COVID is going to be a, a game changer where people realize, whoa, you know, it's not that we don't need hospitals, but, you know, they are expensive. There are complications. They are, uh, and there's these other ways to access certain types of care. And there's room in a sandbox for all of us. It's, a, right. it's almost a $4 trillion system. Right. So let, let's, let's be real. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, with their hands in a cookie jar that, that maybe that money should be shifted around. We talk, we talk about insuring the uninsured. I mean, that's a piece of cake. I mean, we're the richest country in the world. If we want to pay for everybody's health care, we can easily do that. But it's hard to do that when you're, when you're seeing that the money is going towards certain areas, you know, whether it be the last six months of life and keeping people in an ICU, who really, you know, we, we should let them die gracefully with their families at home, if they're, if, you know, in comfort. Um, and, and, and the people who siphon money out of the system and, you know, here in Miami, I mean, the richest people in healthcare, some of the richest people in town are the people who buy and sell um, HMOs and, and sell patients like they're cattle. And, and they, they reinvent, they give it another fancy name. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to say any names because I might get my tires slashed, but you know, people know I'm very uh, upfront about this because it, it really bothers me when day in and day out, I see patients that I can't, I can't take care of because, you know, they want to be in a network. And I say, well, I'm not a network, but I'm willing to talk to your insurance company and, and do it for a reasonable fee. But no, you, you know, you have these middle managers that and they, they're like, they have these blinders on and that that's not the way to deliver healthcare. It's not the way to deliver healthcare. So uh, I, I think that we're gonna, we're really gonna see, there's already big shifts going on in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of uh, a surgery, whether it be uh, outpatient centers, independent outpatient centers or, or the hospital. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, yeah. Back to the efficiency of your surgery center, and this, this will kind of shift our way into talking about ortho now. Um, one of my friends that did have the luxury of spending a day with you during a surgery, he told me that you had like a pharmacy, PT, a surgery center, all the imaging you need, everything under one roof. Um, can you tell us, like, did you know that coming in that you wanted kind of like a one-stop shop for everything or how does that also help your patient and, and how and what did you- was, And what was the inspiration for ortho now and, and what is it, tell us, tell us our audience about that as well. Sure. Um so uh, it's funny, Dan, you use the word one-stop shop because we, we, we use that uh, term a lot now. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I think efficiency is important, but that leads to, to really better, better um, patient satisfaction uh, and certainly cost savings, right? If you're running around town going, so I have all the imaging. Now, again, going back to the insurance company, I, I cannot fathom why, um, you know, why, for example, for the last you know, decade, I haven't been able to do um, an MRI on my Blue Cross patients, which are, especially at Ortho Now, is a big sector. Now that's changing. So finally, we, we made inroads, but it took us seven years to make inroads and change that. So you walk into our place, you, you, you get the gamut of care. So I personally have not been to a hospital in over five years at all, other, other than to see my dad who got a calf. <laughs> that was it. Uh, so that, that's pretty amazing, and and but yet there's nothing surprising about it when you think about it. I mean, we have um, our walk-in center at our own little emergency room. We have my my own practice offices for the uh, hand to shoulder. There's other practices. Uh, Dr. Debin, for example, has a these foot and ankle patients in the ortho now. Uh, there is yes, we do medication dispensing. We have our own uh, supplements, our own brand supplements with ortho now. We even have CBD. <laughs> we have a bracing. Uh, we have other types of imaging, ultrasound, fluoroscopy. Uh, and then we have therapy. So the, the patient can go through and stay in one place. And that in and of itself, it be leads to better care. Why? Because there's communication. When my patient goes to do therapy somewhere else, because a patient doesn't, isn't willing to drive an extra 15 or 20 minutes. I mean, that's their choice. Uh, sometimes the insurance, unfortunately, decides that, but many times the patient will decide. That's a more difficult outcome because mm -hmm. when, there's a, when there's any issue with the patient, the therapist walks across the hall, walks in, grabs me by the ear, 
and pulls me in to see the patient. That's, I mean, as, as, as a patient, that's what I would want, is that all the, the components of my, of my healthcare delivery can all be in one place and all talking to each other. And it's a community where they can feel taken care of yeah. and know yeah. that when they see you walking in the hallway and you guys nod your head and make eye contact, they know that they're not lost in the system. Right. And, and uh, to me, this is a great uh, potential model. And I talk about that as well, uh, a model for, for healthcare delivery. The other day I was speaking with somebody about like, uh, you know, having uh, women's walk-in centers, for example. I even kind of was starting to give it a name. Right? Well, I was thinking about these things. I mean, woman needs a pap smear. Why does she have to wait weeks to see her GYN? I mean, I think it's important you have your regular, uh, you know, your family physician, certain specialties that follow you but when you need something quickly, it's nice to be able to go somewhere and have all of that in, in, in one place. And I think the millennials are going to demand it. I mean, this is changing the world, right? Um, so one thing I'm going to ask, or you guys will ask uh, your colleagues is to take 10 seconds. I mean, it's not as much fun as a dating app, but download uh, the app Ortho Now. And, and there in Ortho Now, you'll, you'll see... The latest uh, addition to that is called Ortho Chat, where we're in the process of trademarking it, where that clinician can speak to say the foot and ankle surgeon versus a hand surgeon, all in a chat, seeing the x-ray, making decisions, like we do all day long texting or in, in WhatsApp, right? And yet in healthcare, we've been, we've been slow to adopt these technologies. So we've been doing it now for a number of years. And uh, what we're hoping for is that it'll get the attention of, you know, Wall Street, because we, to, to, to expand ortho now in this whole concept, uh, you, you need, you know, you need capital, you need capital, you need manpower. So we're in that process. I'm uh, uh, in the process of possibly collaborating with a, a like-minded surgeon in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And we may even do that in New York, where we'd have several centers and bring this model to different, to different cities. That's, that's what our, our, our eventual goal would be. So for the audience, can you give them, you know, a little brief description of what separates ortho now from just going to see any emergency room when they get themselves injured or, you know, the difficulties of getting an orthopedic appointment and getting treated correctly? Sure. Uh, there is a, uh, let me see if I can open that because it's kind of fun to share the screen sometimes, right? People are tired of looking at our <laughs> right. Um, let me let me see if I have it. Yeah. Okay. So you you guys see this here, right? This graph. Mm -hmm. So so here's the emergency room. Um, the emergency room <clears throat> is um, has um, you know a a a, a low uh, expertise and the access isn't very good because you know you're gonna wait a long time, right? So you don't really see an expert because you're seeing somebody who's worried more about somebody having an MI, or, you know, or, or, or a femur fracture, for example, which, you know, can't walk into an ortho now, right? So, uh, so the emergency room is not the place to go for your wrist fracture, your back pain, your, your, you know, your, 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 your injured knee on a soccer field, your industrial injury to the hand, um, unless you've got, you know, three fingers in a, uh, in a, in a doggy bag um, at that point. You know, you, you need to go to a hospital, but for um, for for high expertise but low access, you'd go really to the doctor, meaning meaning the orthopedic surgeon, right? Very expert, but it's not easy to get an appointment. Now, urgent care is a very easy access, right? You can walk into you know what is it? There's MD now. There's a, the Baptist Urgent Care Centers. A, a Broward has theirs now. Um, the problem is that they have low right here, low expertise. You're seeing usually a family practice physician who, you know, is seeing, you know, nowadays are doing COVID testing or look, you know, looking at, at people who have, a, you know, belly pain or, or what have you. Um, but they don't really, they don't know really how to cast. They don't know how to reduce a fracture. They don't know how to diagnose uh, shoulder pain because it just requires a lot of expertise. So we live right in this quadrant of, of, High expertise, but easy access, very, very high uh, access rates, right? Um, and that is the, um, that, that is the, uh, the, the, 
the, the real difference with us and nobody else is doing that. So we, and we treat the entire continuum, right? We have both preventive, and we can go to a company and say, look, this is how you can minimize your, your, your orthopedic injuries, whether it be a factory floor or even a, a big office. Uh, we do the acute episodic cares, and then, and then we also do the, uh, the, you know, we can do chronic and we can rehab them. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is how we're getting people is a quarter of them are coming through, uh, through family and friends. Why? Because we're, we're, so, uh, we're so easy. Uh, so we have the expertise, but we're easy. So it, it, it's every once in a while, well, somebody will compare us to say a general urgent care. I think, in fact, that's why we don't even use the term urgent care. The people have, have thought about that. So we, we call it really immediate orthopedic care or orthopedic walk-in care because 70% of our business isn't even urgent. It's not traumatic. The most common diagnosis that we see is right knee pain. Second most common, I think, is cervical or lumbar pain. So we have all this data analytics that show this, and this, this has value in the marketplace. Do you keep an orthopedic surgeon on staff at all times? Well, there's multiple ones, but I wouldn't say on staff. They're just, they, they all communicate through the OrthoNow app, through OrthoChat, and that patient walks in, but you cannot have you know, a spine surgeon, myself, foot and ankle surgeon, the knee guy, all waiting you know, in the corner for that patient to come in. It doesn't make sense. Every once in a while we get patients, you know, who are a little bit unreasonable. Well, I want to see the doctor. Well, you don't want to see me for your back pain. I haven't worked that up, but, but at ortho now we see back pain every day. So the ortho PAs who are not, you don't have, we're not paying at the same rate as somebody who did a six years of surgical training. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not surgical, right? Most stuff that comes into ortho now is not surgical, at least not that night. So, it's better to see a mid-level provider who really has expertise in orthopedics. And then that person will communicate when necessary. And the majority of the stuff is not need communication because it's bread and butter community orthopedic stuff. Somebody comes in with knee pain and they come in with, uh, the other day, um, the, uh, the PA reduced the shoulder dislocation. Now you go to a general urgent care, you, you better pray it's somebody who knows a bit of orthopedics because you're, you're going to walk out of that general urgent care with your shoulder still dislocated, right? And they're going to, and they're, they'll probably send you to the hospital. So now you've got a bill from the urgent care, then you got a fat bill from the hospital, and you're going to be there for hours, whereas you could just walk into our place and get, and get that treatment in usually 70, 70, 70 minutes or less. That's kind of our, 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 our standard. That's, um, that's incredible. Um, so just transitioning a little bit uh, into your book. So you wrote... Uh, a book called Healthcare from the Trenches. Do you mind telling our audience a little bit about that and, and what inspired you to write that? <laughs> well, the inspiration really came from frustration. Uh, it, it just, I, I was seeing that every Monday, the patients who were seeing me had, had been to, you know, maybe the general urgent care, the ER, the occupational health center, you know, and they, and they were going there and every single patient was coming in saying, oh, they told me I have a shoulder sprain. And I, and I would say to myself, what's a shoulder sprain? I'm not even sure what, what entity that is. But, but, you know, they, but these very general diagnoses, and I said, you know, maybe our, our healthcare system needs a little, a little refining. I mean, we all worry about the cost. Well, the examples I just gave mm -hmm. uh, have high cost. But if you, if you went to the right clinician at the right time, that's going to be a lot cheaper. So I... I basically collected the opinions of over 25 uh, other clinicians, of, whether it be nurses, physical therapists, even a few patients, to tell the story about how um, cumbersome it is to really receive uh, and deliver healthcare uh, in, our, in our system. And, it, and it's getting more cumbersome and it's getting more expensive. Uh, and and the, the concern here is that, you know, when Obamacare was rolled out, I mean, I, to this day, I still don't really know what that what it means. <laughs> All I know is there are some some good parts to it where you know you can't be denied for pre existing conditions and and all these little things, but those are easy. What the hard part is is really changing the system so that we can minimize all these middlemen that take a lot of money out of the system and and don't add anything. On the contrary, they actually. Uh, they actually make, make the whole process more cumbersome 
and more expensive. So when lockdown came, I had been lecturing in, um, I was in Melbourne, Italy, Melbourne, Italy, Melbourne, Australia. I had been in Italy skiing when, when COVID broke. Believe it or not, I was in the epicenter. I was in Bergamo, which, which was killed a month later. So uh, I then came home, worked, and then I went to Australia. And that was when Tom Hanks got diagnosed. And when Tom Hanks got diagnosed, all of a sudden the entire world cared about COVID, <laughs> you know, the celebrity. And, uh, and I managed to get home and then lockdown came. And I, I sat down and, um, and here it is. I just, just basically uh, sat at this terminal and, and, and knocked out the book in, um, in 12 to 14 hour days. Uh, I felt like the story had to be told. I, I, I really did. Um, my, my biggest challenge is, you know, getting people to, to read it. It's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, I don't know. Some people have said to me it's tough reading because there's a lot of, but other people have said it, it, that it flows very well. I, I think the, the important thing is that the public, not so much us, the clinicians, even though I think we enjoy it because we can relate to it, but I really think people who care about, um, about our society and about something as important as healthcare who don't know a lot about healthcare. I think it was really written for those people. And that's, that's why I'm hoping we'll read it. But uh, again, that, that the challenge is, you know, unless nowadays, unless you, you, you either, you know, have some Instagram person with millions of followers who promotes it, or you're on CNN, it's very hard to get the bandwidth. But, uh, you know, we'll see. The, the one great thing is it's, it's, it's had a lot of good reviews. And I think organically, it, it will grow. I mean, exponentially, as, as yeah. more people read it and tell five or six people about it, it can. Right. Yeah. Well, well, one other thing that, you know, people can, who are listening in, I mean, just go. Uh, I know that the younger generation doesn't go on Facebook much, but, um, but in Instagram and other things, it's, you can't really have these dialogues easily. So on, on Facebook, there's a, a group. And they're, they're very, really cool groups. Uh, there's one for, you know, people in Doral. I'm, I'm, my center's in Doral near the airport. Um, so there are these groups that can talk about issues. So the group is simply called Healthcare from the Trenches. And the idea there is for people to go there and, you know, you know bitch or moan about something that happened in healthcare delivery and say, you know, how can we change this? You know, they, or, but, but people aren't, you know, there really isn't a lot of people going, even though, Everyone will complain. Oh, they they denied this, or or this cost me this, and uh, patients are not engaging with that. So at some point, maybe somebody in our, who's a real influencer in our society will get interested in the idea, whether it be with my book or or, or otherwise, and call attention to this. And I I make the joke. It's not so funny, but like, what's it going to take, right? I mean, I don't. We don't want people to burn cars and break windows. To bring about social change, but healthcare affects all of us. Uh, it affects all of us, and I'm amazed that people aren't sort of more upset about it mm -hmm. because it's. And I think we've just kind of accepted it. Oh my, my insurance company told me this, or and yet we just accept it. I'm, I'm hoping that'll change. You've obviously accomplished so many different things, and you're doing a lot of things um, to change the system in a positive way. How? What advice can you give to medical students who, who want to affect change in the system and, and want to create new things, uh, whether it be from political, social, or entrepreneurial endeavors within medicine? There's one advantage that wasn't around even a, a short number of years ago. I mean, now, uh, you know, social media has its ills, but certainly, certainly there's a huge amount of advantage is that for really no cost, you can get a concept or an idea out there. Uh, the question is, can we stop being, you know, really so politically correct? Uh, if something just is an injustice, it doesn't make sense. We've got to say it and we've got to talk about it. And that's the only way it's going to change. And I, I think people are just accepting it. And I'm hoping that this generation says, whoa, this, 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 this doesn't make sense. And um, I, I think that's, to me, that's the most important thing is, is talk about it, talk about it, uh, share the ideas. Uh, the, the positive ones, the negative ones, and and discuss solutions. That is the uh, 
I mean, it's not, you know, writing a book. I mean, that, you know, we, for one, if we all read books, right, we all wrote books, nobody would have time to read them all, right? So it's not that, it's, it's the interactions that we have. And, and frankly, what you guys are doing, I mean, this, this is, you know, great. In, in, my, uh, in my county, there's, not, there's two medical schools. There hasn't been this kind of engagement. And believe me, I've tried. Uh, I mean, I, I've given up with UM, frankly, um, but, but, you know, FIU is a very community facing medical school and we're now re-engaging with them and, and hoping uh, because they're not very far away from our, uh, so the, these are the, you know, the physicians of tomorrow. So we, we, I think that what we're doing here is really the, the, the first start and, and be open-minded. It's, it's amazing how many people will hear of an idea and, and not really consider, I mean, I mean, stop, listen, think about how that idea could be incorporated into your life, into your practice, into society. Thank you. And then um, this would be my last question. And then Raj, if you have any follow-ups after that. Um, so you've done a lot in your life. You know, you've had to go through residency. You became an orthopedic surgeon. You're an entrepreneur, um, all this stuff. Have you had any failures that come to mind? And when you do face failure, how do you how do you recover and then get back up and just attack life again with the same enthusiasm? I think if you speak to any entrepreneur, they'll tell you failure is, is absolutely part of it. It's not that way in in, in you know, say traditional medicine. I mean, you go out about eighty five percent of your colleagues now are being hired by hospitals, healthcare systems as hired physicians. When I graduated NYU, I think it was 6% of our class. We went from six to 85 in 30 years. So it's, it's a market difference. Um, um, I, I, I think the problem with entrepreneurship is that, is that you're, you're trying to change something. So if you've asked me if I failed, I mean, absolutely. Um, uh, ortho now to me should have really taken off. Uh, it started as a franchise, so I can tell you that that failed miserably. Why? Because it's not like flipping burgers, uh, opening an ortho now. There's so much complexity to it. And getting the franchisee, the person who you know, buys your franchise is supposed to follow your, your playbook. It's very hard to get them to do that. So I, I realized that once I'd already spent uh, some years and money. So to me, that was an abject failure. But the concept is so good that I, I find it hard to give up. And Anything you read, I've, I'm surrounded by books here about, about entrepreneurship and they'll all tell you that many people um, were about to quit when their idea really hit. So I feel like I'm in that this year. Uh, I think COVID will be a, a game changer for that. So I'm, I'm really trying to focus on that. But there's no question, um, a lot of what I've done in sort of that entrepreneurial side, uh, I, I've had a lot of, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, the important thing is to learn from them and realize that that's just part of the process. I, I'm like many people. I, um, I, it's hard. It's hard for me to deal with those mistakes. But you, you, it's just you, once you accept that it's part of the process, then you just pick yourself up and and keep going. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I had, did have one last question. Um, who or what inspires you? And uh, as helped you get to where you are today? Well, you know, when I, when I wrote the um, sort of dedication of the book, that's where you kind of think about that. And, and the first people were my grandparents, you know, my grandmother, um, my parents, you know, as immigrants from, from Cuba have always supported me. I've had several mentors. I had uh, uh, my swim coach. I'm, tr I'm still trying to find the guy. I cannot, for some reason he is <laughs> absent on Google. So, uh, I, I still want to reach out to him after all these years, um, uh, and then and then my um, my my um, uh, my mentor uh, Joan Briglia, who kind of taught me how to have a common sense approach. Uh, hand surgeons we tend to be very overly meticulous, and 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 yet he taught me how to look at things that from a, take a simpler approach, and I really run my practice that way. Um, I, I, in fact, I even do my surgeries, I think, a lot quicker, more efficiently than a lot of people because I, I, I've learned to ignore the, uh, well, as my swim coach would say, ignore the riffraff. Uh, uh, so there are people 
along the way who will influence you. And I think it's important to just take a little bit um, uh, from each of them. And, and, and by the way, I've done that internationally. We didn't talk a lot about that, but I love to travel. So one of the things I do very differently is that a lot of my, the, the way I do surgeries is because I was, say, in Italy and at, a, at, a, at the opening cocktail for the Italian Hand Society. And one of the guys shows me an operation on a, on a cocktail napkin. I said, oh, I, I like that way better than what I'm doing. I'm gonna, and I bring that back and I, uh, and then I butcher it. I actually changed it thinking I was doing what he taught me and it was different, but it actually worked well. So, so because of him, I did something differently. And so I'm always open to, to doing something differently. And I think that's one piece of strong advice I could give to people is, is be open-minded. and Don't be afraid to try something different. Well, thank you so much for giving us the or for yeah giving us the opportunity to sit down and talk to you we really appreciate it um for our yeah. audience who wants to find your book maybe your website instagram is there anywhere where you specifically want to lead them yeah. to find you yeah you know this this is a new thing nowadays you got to have all these handles so uh i'm on instagram as a, a dr b ortho now that's just dr b ortho now my website is is dr badia dr badia Dot com for the book we we did a simple url it's dr badia book.com which takes you to healthcare from the trenches but that's a lot of typing i'll give it a chance and then on amazon it's very easy i mean in amazon you just you know you can either type in my name or or healthcare trenches and it'll come up so uh one thing i pride myself is i'm very accessible so i think if anybody who's watching this drops me a quick note i really do my best to uh, respond uh, sometimes it falls through the cracks. Uh, if that happens, just write me again. It just means that, you know, I, I saw the email here. I said, oh, I'll answer when I sit down. Uh, and then, and then, then it's 300 emails back and I, and I lose it. But, uh, but I, I certainly communicate that way with patients. So I, I think, again, I, 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 the theme was, was, was collaboration, uh, openness to ideas, sharing ideas. And, and that's the only way we're going to move forward. And I'm hoping that in some small way, the book um, helps uh, our society to, to deliver better health care. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good luck in your careers. The Medical Muse is produced by Timothy Crow. Your hosts are Daniel Epstein and Raj Kavadi. Social media coordinator, Anja Vonderosen. Music on the show by Foxy Music. For more information, check out foxymusic.com. Join us next episode where we talk with Dr. Erica Wigdor, DO, an internal medicine physician specializing in nutrition and preventative medicine, all while documenting it on her Instagram famous page, Dr. Diaries. Lastly, we'd love to connect with you. Follow our Instagram, the underscore medical underscore muse, or on Twitter at medicalmusepod. See you next time.